It is June 1st, 2021. We are back with a new episode of Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And it is me, Danielle Hallen, and I'm so excited to be here. I am too. I love this time whenever we get together once a month with this special group of amazing audience. Thank you guys so much for being here. <laughs> it feels great to be back. And Danielle, it feels really good to be in the right spot. Mm -hmm. And yep. I just want to say congrats to Tiki for being one of the first to figure out that we had switched sides for our last episode about crazy British crimes. I also need to apologize to Krista Smith. Krista said, I'm surprisingly more disturbed by the side switch than I would have expected. <laughs> I know they're really I'm telling you what it actually kind of threw me off as well the entire episode yeah we even joked about it before we kind of started and everything was going on I was like I feel like I can't even speak English properly like my words aren't coming out right I keep looking the wrong place so don't worry you guys it threw us off too <laughs> yeah yeah everything about that episode was was interesting but it was fun and different and hey I, I had a good time <laughs> mm -hmm. there's just so much great support in the comments I also wanted to say I loved the comment from Linda Jean House, who wrote a little mini script that just highlighting <laughs> one of the crazy points of last month's episode. Here's a script. What are you in for? Murder. You? Stealing biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine how that kind of conversation would go over. Be like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I, I feel like I almost have to apologize for being just becoming just completely fascinated by jammy Dodgers. Uh, as a matter of fact, crime after crime supporter and my producer slash co-host on Case Cracked. She's also literally my right arm over on the Lord and Arts channel. Christy Arnhart has told me she's bringing some jammy Dodgers to Crime Con. And I cannot wait to let you guys know all about them on next month's special crime after crime one hour jammy dodger review episode <laughs> extravaganza okay well um i have to make a confession uh oh what so i was i was casually walking through the international aisle at the grocery store okay. and i was dying to try them too and i saw them i had no clue i was going to be able to find them here i think it was in like a Publix or something i had very high hopes but my yes? my confession is that I tried them. Yes. I don't like them. Wh what? Danielle. I really don't. I don't like them. My kids didn't even like them. But okay, I I will say, I feel like this is coming from an unfair standpoint because I'm used to things with so much sugar. I'm an American, you know. You're expecting a cookie. Yeah. And I think we're, I, I just feel like we're so used to everything having so much sugar in it. And so that's sure. kind of what you go and expecting. And it was totally not like that. So I don't, I will give it another try. I just think my brain was thinking it was going to be something it wasn't. Kind of like when you're like, oh, I'm going to take a sip of this Sprite and it ends up being like water and your brain's oh. like, whoa. Yeah. I feel yeah. like it may have been one of those situations, but I mean, so far I would never, ever go to jail for that. <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, you've tempered my expectations now. Maybe I'll be sure to have a cup of tea with me. Maybe okay. I'll have to give it a little dip. I don't know. Uh, I'll try it both ways, but um, <laughs> all right. I think it's that time that we get to voting results with Danielle for last episode, Craziest British Crimes. Danielle told the story of a team of retirees who pulled off a brilliant bank heist. And I told the story of a team of goofballs pulling off a brilliant jammy dodger heist and then mouthing off in the courtroom as they were being hauled off to jail. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. So the voting Twitter poll, 35% of the votes for me and John destroyed it with 65% of the votes. The magic of jammy dodgers. I'm telling you, and I still don't get it, <laughs> but we'll go with it because it was a great story. And I even loved even better that, you know, they had done this as well before disaster. And then on the <laughs> website poll, 29% of the votes for me and 71% for John, which means I have to hand the mug over. Wow, how it's been a long time. Let's see it. Let's see All it. All right. Oh, oh. There it is. Oh Enjoy goodness. It. Thank you. Danielle. There's you some left, tea for your Jimmy lips, Dodgers. And there's lipstick all over it. What? <laughs> tea for oh, Jimmy yeah. Dodgers. See? It is. It's perfect. <laughs> okay. Today we are looking for the unluckiest criminal. Now, this could mean a lot of things. Are they naturally unlucky? Does their luck run out? Or are they simply just a klutz like me? Now, there's a good chance 
that if your name has come up in any episode of Crime After Crime, you're an unlucky criminal. That's very true. <laughs> there's, there's a very good chance of that. Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I say we jump right into it with today's first story from, from the wonderfully talented Danielle Hallen. I'm ready, Danielle. All right. Now, I was so excited for this topic because something that I've always found very fascinating with crime is simply put the audacity of criminals. Like, I feel like we all don't agree with crime, but sometimes I really question myself. You know, because of the way the media works, every time we turn on a TV or check the news, we're usually hearing about a crime, but then very quickly afterwards, typically how the criminal was caught. And I've never understood how criminals collectively know that their chances of success are slim, and then they still somehow think it's all worth it. <laughs> so technically, I feel like most of them are unlucky, but there are some of them that kind of push it over the edge, and that makes for a golden story for this podcast. All right. In July of 2014, Phoenix, Arizona was experiencing an increase in home invasions and burglaries. Now, most of the burglaries were occurring in a location called Arcadia. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Okay, it sounds right. And this isn't really all too surprising. Many wealthy couples and families were drawn to Arcadia because of the unique independent shops. There's lots of cocktail bars, trendy lounges, beautiful trails, magnificent million dollar homes. And obviously the burglars are drawn to the area for the exact same reason. Mm -hmm. So family after family would come home over that summer to their home broken into and valuable items missing. And it got to the point that local authorities decided they had to really step it up and solve the issue as a top priority. Based on the frequency and the specific area they theorized, it was likely the same individuals committing all, if not at least most of the crimes, because clearly the burglars were skilled. You know, it's, you know, likely a handful of them um, together working in a group. They had this planned out to a T. Nobody ever saw them coming or going. They hit at really unexpected times of the day as well. Yeah. Um, and they never really left a trace behind to lead authorities to their arrest. It was like chasing ghosts. So Phoenix police decided to hold a police conference because of this, and they asked all of the homeowners and the renters alike in the area to keep an eye out for suspicious activity and call into police right away because they figured, you know, we can't catch them after the fact. No one's seeing them leave. Maybe someone will watch them coming or, you know, they're possibly scoping things out beforehand. Yeah. So they thought this was really their best bet. Unfortunately, in the next few months, a few more homes were burglarized by these invisible criminals, but in July, things took a turn. So the plea to the public came in handy because on July 24th, a resident in a well-known Arcadia neighborhood called something suspicious into police, believing they actually may have spotted the group of criminals. It was around 7 p.m. that night, and this witness saw two men wandering around the neighborhood that they had never seen before. These young men were kind of eyeing nearby homes and even ventured onto this person's neighbor's property. So out of the off chance that this was the burglars, authorities had been searching for this whole time. They sent officers to the location to check it out, which, by the way, I personally feel like they moved a little slow. <laughs> but, okay. you know, they casually made their way there. But it turned out authorities wouldn't even need to lift a finger. The burglars chose the wrong home to break into this time. Uh oh. While they were very skilled at hitting houses quickly and efficiently, they definitely were not prepared, or should I say, trained for what they came up against. While authorities were en route to check on the situation at the nearby airport, a woman named Brianna Danielson had just picked up her 33 year old husband, Brian Danielson. They had moved into the local Arcadia neighborhood about 10 days prior, and they fell in love with the community. They both spent a lot of time traveling for their job, and with local burglaries on high, they were very concerned, but their neighbors greeted them, took them in with open arms, and blew them away. There was even this huge cookout the weekend before, where it wasn't necessarily, it was like, of course, a get-to-know-each-other type of thing, but it was also, how can we help protect you? You know, we'll watch each other's houses. This can be a group effort. They were offering to park in neighbors' um, driveways if they were out of town to make it seem like someone was there. And to them, they thought their neighborhood was untouchable despite these burglaries. Wow. Yeah. I love that neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's like it's, to live. Yeah. it's like a neighborhood watch on steroids mm -hmm, almost. Exactly. Or yeah, that's awesome. 
So that weekend, Brian had gone out of town for Comic-Con and had been attending physical therapy frequently the few days before. So while they had settled into their home, they actually had to postpone their appointment to install a security system. Mm. But thankfully, they didn't end up needing one. I'm telling you, the stars really align in this one. So shortly after 7 p.m., they were just pulling into their driveway. He was tired from Comic-Con. And this was about 10 minutes after the call had been made into authorities. But Brianna and Brian were totally unaware about the fact that this call had been made. And they had no idea that it was actually their neighbor that called it in. And it was their house that the suspects had approached. But it didn't take long for them to realize on their own that something was very wrong. As they pulled into their carport, they noticed that the side door to enter the home opened slightly and then very quickly slammed shut. Oh, jeez. And that's actually happened to me before. And when I tell you, I was scared out of my mind. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Their minds immediately went to what, you know, a lot of people would go to. And that's their largest prized possession. You know, they're now realizing their house is the target of these mysterious burglars. And their most prized possession was actually their beloved French bulldog, Josie, who was oh. like a child to them. Oh, no. Exactly. You know, they knew they had a handful of valuable items in the home. I feel like most of us, you know, we may not have tons, but they knew they had things in there of importance. Um, and they were worried about that, but they were more worried that Josie would end up either getting in the way of these robbers. And there's, you know, no telling what they might do in that circumstance. As a pet owner that's had my house burglarized, I completely understand that. Yeah. But they were also worried about the fact that the robbers might realize there was nothing really of substance to take in the house and mm. they would actually take Josie instead. Right, right. I mean, I don't know if it's common where anyone else is, but we have dogs stolen out of backyards all the time where I live. Yeah. So both Brianna and Brian jumped out of the car to check out the situation. Now, Brianna's main goal was getting into the house and locating Josie to make sure that she was okay. And Brian was going to check and see if the burglars were still inside. And they were. Brian ended up walking right into the burglars in the act, which you would think is already very unlucky. <laughs> now, hold on. Brian was just coming back from a con, right? From a comic con? Yes. Was he dressed up as a stormtrooper or something? <laughs> I really wish. I feel yeah. like that would be, I, I genuinely do. I think that would be hilarious. Imagine yeah, robbing Thor. a house. And yeah, like Thor, Thor shows up. The front door. <laughs> I'd be like, man, I got real unlucky this time. Oh my goodness. But he did. He walked in on them. And two men were standing in the middle of his house with bags of goods. And as soon as they saw him, they dropped everything and booked it out the back door. Brianna had not found Josie yet. And they were worried for a second that one of the guys may actually have her again because forget the belongings you take my dog it's over with so yeah. they had to make another hard decision while many people would likely freak out at this point there's so many moving parts happening already you know you're face to face with the burglars i feel like you typically get home and it's already happened or something of the sorts you think your dog's gone most people would likely freak out probably go back to the car get themselves out of the situation call the cops but not Brian and Brianna. Why he's do you going, ask? He's going John Wick, isn't he? Because these burglars broke into the house of two WWE wrestlers. Oh, no. What? <laughs> not just one. <laughs> Both Brian and Brianna were well-known WWE wrestlers. Oh, my goodness. So Brian, his name is Brian Danielson, and I think his... His stage name is the American Dragon, but I think he does Daniel Bryan as his name. He like okay. switches his first and last name. Okay. But he has an extensive WWE history. He held the WWE Championship four times, World Heavyweight Championship once, United States Championship, Intercontinental Championship. I mean, the list just goes on and on. He trained for years in Japan in martial arts. Okay. Yeah. He is something else. He's actually known for his yes lock, which is a move he kind of created himself. It's defeated pretty much all of his opponents. And it's it's most known because when he does it, his fans will cheer yes repeatedly right. in the background. Imagine being the person <laughs> taken down in that situation. You're like, well, this is weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because we were saying like, what if, what if, you know, Thor walks in or something? Yeah, Essentially, basically Thor did. <laughs> Thor did. Yeah. 
Yeah. Two and Thors, now it's like makes, a woman Thor and a male Thor. <laughs> right. Now it makes sense why uh, he was at the Comic-Con. He was working. He was. Yeah. He actually, he spoke about this. I can't remember who exactly. He had had this huge meeting too with like two of the most random individuals there. He was like, it was such a weird time. You know, I, I was just talking that morning, having a great time. I was exhausted coming back home and then yeah. like, bang. <laughs> exactly. So... He also, though, wasn't your typical WWE wrestler. He was actually described as being very quiet, laid back, calm, and reserved. They take mm. a personality test, and he was on, like, the calmest end. So they did get lucky in that chance. <laughs> <laughs> but seeing as his dog potentially was hanging in the balance, he wasn't going to hold back. Also, despite being uh, down, actually out of wrestling, for a neck injury, a severe mm -hmm. neck injury. He had already had surgeries, was about to go in another surgery, and was at 50% strength in one arm. He still decided to take out this man. So Brianna did manage to find Josie unharmed, but terrified, hiding in their bathroom. And she had attempted mm. to run outside to tell Brian that, you know, she was safe. You don't have to do this, but it was too late. She saw him tearing off in the distance. Everything at this point is an absolute frenzy. We have Brianna, who's panicked, worrying that these men may be armed and possibly harm him. You know, you never know. And yeah. Brian was panicking, thinking that his dog had been taken. There's neighbors that are watching that are calling 911. 911 realize, wait a minute, this is more of an emergency than we thought. So they're hopefully rushing to the scene. And these two burglars are quite literally running for their life, horrified as a mammoth of a man is charging at them. Right. <laughs> Yeah, but the chase didn't last long for one of the perpetrators. After only 54 yards, he clearly was absolutely gassed, and Brian began to catch up to him. The second man realized it was over with if he didn't do something immediately, so he branched off and actually narrowly escaped an embarrassing fate, just as Brian tackled the other guy to the ground. He has since stated the famous wrestling quote of exhaustion makes cowards of us all. Mm -hmm. And it really did for this guy. Brian could tell this guy was very out of shape, was very unprepared to have to run this far away from the crime scene. And he said it took absolutely no effort to get this guy down. And, you know, he's got a neck injury and 50% strength in one arm. And he's just yeah. like, eh, it was nothing. Right. <laughs> but I will say, ironically, for some reason, he didn't do the yes lock on this guy. Oh, bummer. <laughs> I know. Instead, he put him in a rear naked chokehold. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine being the neighbors just like watching this happen? Seriously. Grab the camera. <laughs> I know. I will say he only put enough pressure to kind of subdue this guy, which served its purpose beautifully. He wasn't like intending yep. to severely hurt him. But again, I can only imagine, you know doing a rear naked choke on someone running away from your home. Mm -hmm. Now, these burglars that had successfully ransacked numerous homes in the area, they've evaded arrest, just so happened to choose this house that could have honestly been the best one. There was no security. They newly moved in, literally out of town. They could have easily probably picked up a box and ran with it. This guy's injured, upcoming surgery, but like somehow all of these stars aligned. They literally yeah. got home at the exact same time and ended up being tackled. <laughs> I know. So the suspect was so taken back by the incident being pinned down on the ground. He actually repeatedly apologized to Brian through gasps of air from being <laughs> winded from the run. He's like on the verge of tears. He doesn't know what this guy's capable of at this point. Yeah. And within a few minutes, authorities arrived and were able to take this one individual into custody. And they later released it was a 22 year old named Cesar Sosa who mm -hmm. took on the wrong home and got the smackdown because of it. However, <laughs> The other suspect was still at large. Authorities ended up finding that the men had entered the home through the back door after breaking into it. That's how they were getting in all the homes. They did drop items on their way out. So they did find a few valuable things. And it made me really sad because one of the bracelets was actually the last thing Brian had from his dad that had just uh. passed away. Uh, yeah, it was really sad. They did a whole interview and press conference and he was crying and he was like, they almost had the one thing I had left of him. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they were able to get it, thankfully. And they were also super thankful Josie was unharmed. The dog was totally fine. Yeah. The dog was even at the press conference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So upon his arrest, Sosa was booked into Maricopa County Jail and charged with burglary. And they even found, um, and it was announced by Sergeant Tommy Thompson, that he had a felony warrant for kidnapping and burglary as well. So wow. huge breath of fresh air that like, we, you know, we've talked about this, you know, superhero essentially like got behind bars. 
but they were still looking for the second individual. They were able to put together local CCTV footage and eyewitness statements since this whole thing caught the attention of the entire neighborhood. It was on like every WWE wrestling platform talking about, you know, because of course that's that's great publicity for them. You know, they have because oh, yeah. oh, WWE yeah. wrestlers get like a bad rap a lot of the time. But when you have them out here helping solve crime they used that a lot oh yeah it's all fake everything they do is fake right yeah uh well no not in this case he chased no. this guy down exactly he like, exactly <laughs> like real life problem solved with the wwe wrestler yeah. so it was actually all of this attention that got people calling in tips and there was all this information coming in they were able to find that there was actually a third and fourth person involved as well that were unseen wow. one of them was a getaway driver but they had more information now that was able to lead them to these other perpetrators. There was a silver Mercedes Benz sedan that had been seen fleeing the sh scene shortly after, and it was not a car that belonged in the neighborhood. And they were able to actually link it to other burglaries. So now they knew what to look for. Right. And sure enough, on August 8th, authorities managed to spot the Mercedes around town. They actually watched them break into two other homes in North Phoenix, hmm. which, okay. How on earth do you watch one of your members of your theft gang that's happening here yeah. get absolutely tackled and choke-holded by a WWE wrestler and then just continue on as if it doesn't phase you at all? Right, right. Yeah. Authorities were able to stop them in the middle of the act. They arrested the individuals and... This brought them to 20-year-old Edward Alexander Johnson, 21-year-old uh, Gilberto Gastelum, and 30-year-old Alexandra Olvera, who was the getaway driver. They actually did pull a handgun and a taser off the individuals at arrest. So kind of makes you wonder if Brian got a little lucky or maybe did they scare, get right. scared so bad they decided to arm themselves, which, you know, could have ended very badly had they not been caught when they did. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Seriously. So all of them were booked into Maricopa County Jail and charged with burglary. Um, and Brian Danielson has since come out and spoken. And he says that he does not recommend chasing after criminals, <laughs> no matter who you are, even if you're a WWE wrestler. That is something that should be left to the police because you just never know if they're armed. You don't know how many there are, who you may not see. Um, there's just too much left in the air. No matter what your intentions are. Yeah. You just don't know. And he said it was kind of more of a fight or flight thing. Mm -hmm. And he immediately went to fight, which kind of makes sense because that's <laughs> that's his job. Um, but he's, <laughs> he has said that he's kind of ashamed of it. He wished he had just let the authorities do their job. He actually said the first thing through his mind after he tackled this guy and put him in a chokehold was, man, am I going to get sued for this? <laughs> right, right. He did. He was like, I thought I was going to get sued. He was like, I wasn't too rough with him or anything. I was just trying to subdue him. He was like, but of course, when you're a WWE wrestler, your first thing you're going to do is just be incredibly rough. You know, it's kind of what you know. Yeah. Thankfully, yeah. that didn't happen. But he also stated, while well, it was very unlucky that they chose to rob a home of a WWE wrestler, not just one, but two of them, that they are very lucky it was the two that they chose. Well, at least Brian that went after them because he's known as being the calmest of them all. And he said if it had been any other wrestler, including even his own wife, that <laughs> had chased these men down, they would have ended up in way more than just a rear chokehold. Like, he's like, they got lucky because I'm just a calm guy. <laughs> Right. He was Jeez. like, my wife would have destroyed them. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's like putting out the warning. Uh, any criminals, make sure, just double check before you go into that house. Uh, yep. This is not an employee of the WWE that lives here, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And a huge thank you to numerous Phoenix News conferences that are available online, as well as Phoenix New Times for the coverage on this case. Also, there's so many different small videos from WWE websites and fan pages. There's so much out there on it. You awesome. got a lot of publicity over it. <laughs> that is really cool. I love that story, Danielle. That's a good one. I mean, it's just so crazy to me how like this, like he was talking about, it. he's like, you know, we're not even at the peak here. He's like, I am very badly injured. It was causing like severe nerve damage. He couldn't, you know, move his limbs properly. He's obviously struggling with the one arm. And he was like, I was, he was like, I thought it was so crazy. You know, I, I had all these physical therapy appointments beforehand. Yeah. He was like, and we were going to have a security system that would have stopped them. And, you know, I put it off because I didn't have time. And 
his wife, Brianna, she'd actually been out in the yard in the same area those guys would have come in literally mm. right before she left for the airport. So there's just so many horrible ways that this could have gone. Yeah. And yeah. but instead. Got the smackdown. Yeah. Lucky. The, the lucky outcome <laughs> happened or the yeah. unlucky outcome happened for yep. the criminals. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Well, uh, interesting. I do think there is a little bit of a similar theme that happens between our stories. This frequently happens on this show, um, but I'm not going to spoil it. You guys are going to have to stay tuned to figure out what it is. But yeah, pretty, pretty strong. We'll be back right after this short break. I am so thankful for HelloFresh. They make everything so simple and so delicious. No stressful meal planning, no desperate internet searches while I've got things burning on the stove. Their no contact delivery brings a box right to my door with everything I need to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. With more than 25 recipes featured every week, eating healthier has never been easier. They also have low-cal, carb-smart, vegetarian, and pescatarian options. Four out of five customers say HelloFresh helps them lead a healthier lifestyle. I love the grilled cheese ciabatta sandwich with fresh tomato, pesto, and balsamic vinegar, roasted potatoes on the side. And Danielle, it doesn't matter if you're unlucky in the kitchen or not. With their amazing instruction sheets, your dinner caper will come together just as planned. Every single recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers and you won't be over buying produce. They send the perfect amount for the recipes, which is easier on the planet. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Crime After Crime 12 and use code Crime After Crime 12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Try Newsweek's most trusted meal kit company of 2021 with over 4 million households served. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Crime After Crime 12 and use code Crime After Crime 12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. We promise you are going to love HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Welcome back, everyone. Very interested to see what is common about the stories because I feel like mine was very random. I even stumbled across, across it. Across it? Oh my goodness. You, you went across it. No, I did. I, I went I across heard that. it. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I stumbled across <laughs> it so randomly. And it's such a, a unique situation. So I can't wait to see how they're similar. Well, that's another way that they're uh, similar because I don't even remember how I got to mine. And it's like, <laughs> it was like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, all right. So here's a little bit about why I think they're similar. We cover many stories on this show where the criminals aren't necessarily the smartest, mm -hmm. but for today's topic, I thought a good challenge would be to find a criminal who's so good they shouldn't have been caught. And essentially, that's kind of what you were lining up with mm -hmm. too. You had a group of criminals that were so good. They were. Th they weren't caught. Doug Wiley, co-host of the Policing Matters podcast, posted at policeone.com that sometimes a successful investigation comes down to whether or not you encounter one lucky break in the case, an unexpected turn in an investigation that is the linchpin in the prosecution of an offender. I looked far and wide for a clevel, clevel criminal. <laughs> I passed it to you. <laughs> yeah. We've got the letters jumping around on the words. <laughs> Uh, I looked far and wide for a clever criminal who had to face an unlucky break. And today we're going to hop in the crime after crime DeLorean, hit 88 miles per hour and head back to 1969 to hear the story of a robbery at an unexpected place. The Oregon Zoo called <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Oh my goodness! Uh, we, I'm we've so lost fascinated. Danielle. I, because my brain just went so fast, like it, like it was an immediate scroll. It was like something out of a movie of all the things you could steal from a zoo. And that, my first thing was monkeys. No nope. seals. No penguins. Don't, no. Don't steal the monkeys. Uh, the Oregon Zoo, called the Portland Zoo back then, was founded in 1888 and is the oldest zoo west of the Mississippi River. The 64 acres currently houses more than 1,800 animals, including 19 endangered species. Now, you might think a zoo wouldn't be a great hit for a thief. Admissions at zoos generally don't compare with other theme parks. However, remember, this is 1969. 
and the zoo had recently gone through a popularity boom due to an elephant named Packy being born there in 1962. The Portland Zoo was, and the Oregon Zoo currently is, one of the most popular visitor attractions in the state of Oregon. Back then, this was largely an all-cash world. So with so many businesses having safes around, yeah. a very specific breed of criminal was on the hunt, Danielle. Mm -hmm. Someone that was very good at his job. Mm -hmm. The Monday morning after the long July 4th holiday weekend gave staff at the Portland Zoo a shock. As they unlocked the door to the concession office, they entered into a crazy scene. The office windows had been blacked out with plastic. The floor was wet. There was white dust covering everything in the office. Now, if this took place in the 80s, I'd say this sounded like the scene of a crazy Coke party, like something out of Miami Vice. <laughs> I was but, just about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but there's more. Tools, including drill bits and chisels, were laid out all over the floor. Towards the back of the room was a wire mesh wall, which had been obviously pried open. That wire mesh separated most of the office from the intended target of the break-in. The safe in the back of the room was wide open. Apparently, some type of blowtorch had been used on it, and it was now completely empty. All of the profits from the long holiday weekend had been stolen. About $70,000 in today's money. Wow. All right, Isn't now, that? breaking into safes here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to give any criminals it's any like ideas. It's like the Italian out there. job. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Portland police detective Don Dupay, known as the Kid, due to him becoming a detective by the age of 31, and his partner John Wesson arrived on the scene and interviewed the zoo executive that made the discovery. And they were very interested in one particular aspect of his story. He said that he had to unlock the door to enter the office. So whoever stole the money locked key. the door behind them when they were leaving. Okay. Isn't that a, a nice little safe robber, Danielle? Mm-hmm. Isn't that thoughtful? Covering all the bases. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Didn't clean also, up their mess, but yeah, won't go there. left a mess, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they did lock the door. They did. <laughs> uh they were also so good they left absolutely no fingerprints behind. The detectives next tried to establish the escape route. Fresh tracks led to a service road near the back of the zoo, but the road was roped off with a chain and a padlock. That padlock was also locked. Was this the most thoughtful criminal in the world, Danielle? That's what it's seeming like. <laughs> oh my goodness. My mind's just going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, just like, it's funny, because uh, just like you jumped to off of here in the first lock, I think most people would be thinking inside job, right? Someone yeah, had absolutely. to have keys. Yeah. Um, but the two detectives felt like these locks were actually a signature and a familiar one at that. Oh, oh man, what a thing being like, yeah, I broke into this and I also locked your lock without having a key. <laughs> Seriously. <that>. Seriously. <laughs> <That's some> sass. <laughs> Dupay was starting to think that this was done by someone that he considered one of the most ingenious burglars of the time, someone that was very difficult to catch, and in a way, someone that Dupay actually admired. Quote, I don't think he cared that we knew it was him. I always thought it was an F.U. And, mm -hmm. and I'm that good type, mm -hmm. type of thing. Dupay thought this was likely the same person responsible for a pawn shop heist in Portland that happened one month before. The M.O.? pretty much the same. Sorf, uh, sorf, there's that word again. <laughs> Safe, torched open, front door locked, no other signs of entry, no forensics to trace the identity. In that case though, Dupay knew that they had someone that the owner of the pawn shop picked from a photo lineup, a man that kept coming into the store several times with a young woman prior to the robbery. Mm. Dupay thought that those visits were done so that his suspect could use a key blank in the locks to get the info that he would need to create a fake key for the actual robbery. Dupay was certain this was all the work of Billy Lewis, a man that Dupay says turned safe cracking into an art form. Billy Lewis worked as a bartender at a few different places. One of them was called Bill's Gold Coin Lounge, which I'm actually wondering if he owned since... Yeah. Bill, Billy, yeah. 
but he would also wear gold coins inserted into the tongue of his penny loafers while he was working there. Standing at five foot seven with his hair usually combed straight back, it was said that his sense of style came right out of a 1940s detective story. An employee that worked with him at another bar called the White Elephant used to call him Mr. Shady. That's a good nickname. Yeah, we're talking back in 69. This is way before Eminem. Uh, <laughs> he told her that he ran a diamond business on the side, but she suspected he really wasn't on the up and up. And she was right. Billy's father, career criminal. And Billy wasn't just great at making cocktails. He was also a key maker, a lock picker, and a safe cracker. Billy had served time in the late 1950s for the robbery of a Portland Longshoremen's Union, and a longshoreman is someone that loads and unloads cargo mm -hmm. from ships. That might be important to remember a little later in the story. Mm. And Billy now had a wife, Marjorie, and Dupay was thinking maybe Billy was trying to bring her into the family business. They were certain that there was more than one person that worked the Portland Zoo job, maybe two or even three. And the pawn shop owner mentioned a woman being with Billy, mm -hmm. possibly running distraction while Billy cased the joint. But Dupay couldn't find anyone any way to get Billy charged in that pawn shop job and was afraid the exact same outcome would happen with the Portland Zoo case. What did they have outside of a suspicion and a connection to another case with another possible suspicion? Remember, we're talking 1969. Yeah. There's no DNA analysis mm -hmm. or anything like that that's going to come into play here. It would take a serious stroke of luck for the detectives or a terribly unlucky development for Billy to take him down. There's just no way a guy this meticulous would be caught, and especially not due to a ham sandwich. Oh, no. <laughs> Two days after the zoo robbery, a longshoreman was taking his lunch break, sitting on a dock facing the water. He saw something floating and bobbing around out there. It looked like a duffel bag. He decided to retrieve it and was very confused to see what was inside. He found gloves, welding goggles, a pair of shoes with some green fibers on the bottom of them, a pay stub for someone named Marjorie Lewis, and scorched empty money bags that read Portland Zoo. Yep. On the back of the pay stub was handwritten notes that looked like a three-way split of about the same amount of money mm -hmm. as was stolen from the zoo. The only thing missing from the duffel bag was a sign on the outside of it that read, everything you would ever need to convict Billy Lewis for robbing the Portland Zoo. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm, exactly. It was just a complete <laughs> kit. <laughs> Literally everything all in one, one bag, wrapped up, ready to go, put a bow yeah. on it. <laughs> Floating down the river. <laughs> Dupe just received the break he had been looking for and in a neat and tidy package. Uh, this load of evidence all being in one place and including documentation with Billy's wife's name on it. Oh almost, my gosh. Almost too good to be true. So they travel to Billy's house, but he's not at home. They enter the house and they find a complete locksmith workshop. Surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. They also noticed green shag carpeting in the room. And after vomiting at the side of it, crime labs would confirm it matched the fibers found on the shoes. <laughs> In the duffel bag. <laughs> Many unlucky things, including choice of carpet. Yes. No one likes the green shag. No. Dupe eventually tracked down Billy at Bill's gold coin, and they arrested him. Back in an interview room, Billy wouldn't talk. But as soon as Dupe pulled out the duffel bag, he could literally see it written on Billy's face. Quote, I hate to admit how much I enjoyed it, the look on his face, Dupe would later say. <laughs> Because really, talk about, I mean, talk about unlucky. In his eyes, he's done this for such a long time at this point. And he's yeah. like, how in the world did you find that? Yeah. And he's not just a pro. Yeah. He's a cocky pro. You know, exactly. like the whole aspect like so of- so confident. Yeah. Relocking the locks. Hey, look what a, look what a pro I am, guys. You're never going to catch me. Yeah. <laughs> Billy Lewis was convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Marjorie was also arrested, but her charges were dropped. She maintained that she had never been to the zoo. The third person, never identified. The Ooh. money, 
never recovered. As a matter of fact, it seems like this story was largely kept from the media. I can't even find newspaper archives discussing it. Yeah. Uh, and even though Wikipedia has an incidents and controversy section in mm -hmm. their article about the zoo, doesn't mention the robbery at all. So in the end, a criminal genius was brought mm -hmm. down by the lunch break of a longshoreman the same occupation whose union had been previously ripped off by Billy. <laughs> Quote, we wouldn't have caught him if that guy hadn't been sitting there eating a ham sandwich at the end of the dock, Dupe stated. Why would someone as meticulous as Billy have not properly weighted down the duffel bag so I it know. wouldn't float? I mean, he's so good at everything. How could he miss a detail like that? Well... Dupe believes that Billy probably had Marjorie handle the dumping of the evidence. Way to and, go, Marjorie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and there's another dumping to occur. Billy and Marjorie would get divorced while he's in prison. And I don't know who, <laughs> who initiated it. Yep. Uh, Billy eventually passed away in 1990. Marjorie passed away in 2006. But Don Dupe, still alive and kicking, he would continue his police career, even cracking a case of stolen diamonds that the owner didn't even realize were taken yet in oh, 1973. <laughs> now, this guy's a hot shot, huh? <laughs> Got a bunch of hot shots in this story. Oh, you didn't know those diamonds were stolen? Well, here they are. You're welcome. <laughs> Eventually, Don would wind up leaving the police force due to numerous stresses from the job and the toll that it took on his personal life. Yeah. He, he eventually became an activist, a cannabis advocate. There's a cool picture of him hanging out with going. Tommy Chong. Yeah. Uh, and also a writer speaking up on many matters, including police reform. Dupe would write about his life in a book called Behind the Badge in River City. And he's recently published a second book called Frank's Revenge. And he promises a third book coming this year. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No. And um, there's another article I have to say, I have to give the biggest thank you to Douglas Perry from the Oregonian mm -hmm. because this story just, it doesn't exist without Douglas retelling yeah. it. Um, and his writing is excellent, but he also wrote a separate article specifically about Don Dupay's life. You guys take some time. If you're interested in the mm -hmm. story, go check out both those articles. They're going to give you so much detail that I can give you here. But Don's life, man. The, the Always stuff. fighting for the good, yeah. Fighting for the good, but also fighting for the good of his own humanity mm -hmm. and how he's struggling with yep. and talks about him having a really serious breakdown after coming off of a murder scene and oh, how he man. was trying to deal with that. And then all of his, you know, just really relationship troubles that mm -hmm. are part of the stress of all this and everything. Um, it's it's really, really good writing by Douglas Perry. So you can check that over at the Oregonian. I also want to give a big thank you to police1.com and Wikipedia for other information contributing to today's story. Uh, Danielle, it seems like the 4th of July also at that particular zoo. Oh, man. I don't know. Terrible things happen there or something. The next year, three young men would break in on the 4th of July after having some beers. One of them decides he wants to show off to some of his friends. Oh, boy. I feel where this is going. He hangs himself from one of the walls into the bear pit. No. Just kind of, you know, hey, come get me, come get me. And, and he pulls it off. He gets back out. They have their big laugh. Then he goes over to the lion den. No. Decides he's going to do the same thing. Does not go so well that time. One of the lions smacks at him. He falls in. And that is it. It's the first fatality in the history of the zoo. The following night... One of his friends went back and shot the lions. Are you serious? Yeah, it's insane. Oh. It's insane. Man, you just hit the mother load over here. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't. And I couldn't believe that I found all kinds of articles about that. And I'm like, what, what about yeah, this? Yeah, what, what about this? Exactly. Yeah. I, I almost feel like they didn't want the robbery information to get out there. Like maybe they thought it'd be more risky if there was articles being written about it and people would come and do it more often. Or I, was I don't about know. To say, yeah, give people ideas, you know, yeah. people at that point, like we were talking about before, probably wouldn't have thought to try to rob a zoo. And so yeah. that would just introduce a whole other issue, you know, not just locally possibly, but even further than that. Yeah. But that to me is the most prime example of karma that I have seen in such a very long time. <laughs> Which aspect? The guy Literally, dangling himself. Yeah. Like, yeah. oh my goodness. And 
how on earth a ham sandwich ham sandwich taking down the guy that's uh relocking the locks behind him well, to show off exactly and what's so interesting about it to me too is i feel like criminals that get very cocky and like very confident in themselves and try to play those games where they're you know kind of mocking police and being like oh you can't catch me you can't do this like i'm impressed that he actually maintained himself for so long the way that he did and i find it mm -hmm. even more hilarious that he you know when you're that cocky that he even possibly let someone else do more dirty work for him yeah you know possibly sending marjorie to dump that i can only imagine that may possibly be why they divorced what if he was like you messed up for all of us <laughs> right <laughs> and he's like you had to throw it there yeah. and it was seen by you know the same well, place and, where and, I'd robbed it before in a dang sandwich and he was just trying to enjoy his lunch break and now my life is over <laughs> <laughs> and if Marjorie was in on the yeah. job and she got part of that three-way cut, she got off, you know, free mm -hmm. and clear, essentially. So yeah, who knows? I'm I'm sure that's some pressure on a relationship. Oh man, I something really, like that. I really wish I understand what they were saying when they're like the look on his face. Because yeah. I mean, that really is like the one unluckiest thing ever to happen to a criminal. And I hate saying that from a sense of I'm not saying they don't deserve things like that to happen. I wish that happened in every case where, you know, yeah. something came oh, yeah. back to bite him. But I can only imagine the look on his face, especially with how cocky he was, just being dumbfounded. There's something that the cool. simplest thing. Literally, I mean, just I mean, you might as well have just mailed it to the police department. <laughs> uh, seriously. Oh I mean, it, it is a package. I mean, the, the evidence in it's ridiculous. You didn't even have to search for anything else. Yeah. There is a really cool aspect in terms of Don kind of respecting mm -hmm. Billy's work in a way. Like Don even learned about uh, lock picking and mm -hmm. using blanks to make his own keys. Like he, yeah. he went down the whole rabbit hole of trying to understand that mm -hmm. mentality and got to learn about it more. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's... Uh, it's a pretty interesting story. I thought you would like that one. Yep. And it's going to bother me forever that we don't know who that third person is. I know. I know. Someone it adds like an free awesome, and clear. yeah, an awesome, like mysterious element to this story as well. Like, could you yeah. imagine them going on just like the rest of their lives knowing that the other two were caught and they're like, okay, <laughs> right? Good. we're going to do um, favors for people every day. So my luck doesn't run out. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. They were thinking that um, on a setup like that for hitting mm -hmm. that type of office, you would have like, let's say Billy's working the safe. Yep. Then you're going to have someone that's keeping an eye at the front. Exactly. Like, like a like lookout. A getaway and then driver type person. A getaway driver. Exactly. Yeah. So it was probably the getaway driver. Um, I would imagine that Marjorie was in the room with Billy uh, working the safe. I guess she could have been in either position mm -hmm. actually now that I think about it. But Makes um, me wonder if it was family or, right, right. you know, like a really close friend. I don't yeah. know. That's crazy. Especially yeah. if, you know, it's Marjorie and him doing it together. That would only make sense. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I could get so deep into this. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get even deeper, but I'm telling you, I just, I couldn't find it. I kept, yeah. I kept I've searched this story every which way I could. Um, but I'm really, really thankful that we had a great writer uh, pick it up and, and sh share it and save mm -hmm. it for time. All right, Danielle. Well, I think it's that time where... We're getting to the extra stories, little mm -hmm. tidbits that we found in our research that maybe couldn't make the full story, um, but things that are fun that we want to share with you guys out there. Danielle has one that she wants to start with. All right. This is so incredibly unlucky. And then it brings in more of the audacity element, which just had me rolling. So in April of 2012, in the town of Beaver Creek, Ohio, 39-year-old Robert Strank had plans to rob the Huntington Bank. Now, unfortunately, for reasons that I'm unaware of, as soon as he entered the building with these huge plans, he's going to get all the money, he passed out. <laughs> like, out cold, <laughs> fell onto the ground. And at this point, no one in the bank has any clue that he had bad intentions. Like, he had just, just walked into this bank. So they obviously called, you know, someone to come and help. And at some point, while waiting for the medics to arrive, he woke up still on the ground the teller was right beside him and he looked at her and i've seen two versions i think this isn't you know i don't know which one it is but yeah. i've seen that he either like just directly looked at her and was like give me all of your money but i've also seen that he actually just like pulled like slowly pulled a note out of his pocket and just handed it to her demanding <laughs> all the money like on the floor probably not even fully back yet 
Right. Now, obviously, because he wasn't really in a great position of leverage, you know, the medics arrived. He did not get that money that he had asked for. And they assessed him, then handed him over to police where he landed attempted robbery charges. I oh, wonder if goodness. he got like so scared he passed out. That's <laughs> what it sounds like. He forced himself into a yeah. situation that uh, his body just said, nope, we're not doing this. <laughs> going down. Lights out. <laughs> <laughs> no rob in the bank for you, Shank. You're going down right here. And can you imagine seeing, hey, look, there's a, a gentleman just walked in the bank. Oh, yeah. my God. He passed out. What are those bags? And what is that a gun? I know. What's he <laughs> I know. And then he like opens his eyes and is like, oh, money, money now. Yeah. <laughs> and you're Give like, me the this, money. This, is, this isn't good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Give me all your money. I love that. <sighs> just love the visual of it. I know. All right, 2014 in Idaho, Jacob Moore knew the cops were getting close to tracking him down. He had violated his probation. There was a strange car with two men sitting outside, and Jacob had to get out of his house without being seen. If only he had some way to distract the police by pulling all of their resources to another issue. That's when the light bulb flickered over his head. He picked up the phone. An employee at Atlas Elementary School received a strange call. It was a bomb threat, but the caller didn't disable their caller ID. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's unfortunate. <laughs> the kids were quickly re relocated to a nearby building while police were notified about what happened and provided with the name and phone number that came up on the caller yep. ID. Uh, mm -hmm. The two officers that were, they, they were there. They were sitting yeah. outside Jacob's house. We're here. Don't worry. <laughs> All of a sudden, the warrant that they were waiting for instantly approved. Go in and get him. Went in and arrested him. On top of his previous charges, Jacob also got a new one tacked on for false report of a bomb threat, which Man. is a felony. He did himself no favors. Seriously, calling in a <laughs> bomb threat to a school. I know. Come on. I know. Like, imagine what you put the kids through at this point, and like, you don't don't yeah. act in moments of panic. And that's not just for criminals; that goes for everyone. You never make a great decision. This is yeah. just a prime example of a criminal version of that. I love it. I love oh it. Caller ID, mm -hmm. napped by caller ID. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I've got one. It's kind of it's interesting, but I can assure you, these individuals they probably learn their lesson. So, in the good old <laughs> state of Florida. Okay. We actually haven't spoken about Florida in a while, I feel like. I know. But I'm surprised. I'm here, I'm here to bring it back. Town okay. of Silver Springs in 2011. Thieves had broken into a woman's home and ransacked it. She got home and noticed that she had jewelry missing, electronics missing. But in a strange twist, the urn containing of the ashes of her father and a second urn containing the ashes of her two beloved Great Danes they were also missing. Uh -oh. Now, authorities didn't immediately catch the criminals until a few weeks later at another burglary. They ended up apprehending five separate teenagers, and when they sat them down to speak to them, they were able to connect them to the previous burglary where they asked about why they took the urns. They got a horrible story saying that they actually <laughs> believed these urns contained cocaine, and they very quickly found out the hard way that the urns did not contain cocaine. That was that was not the case. So I will leave that to your imagination. Uh, what? No. Hold they on were... a second. <laughs> Hold on. A, you can't just run over that, Danielle. They assumed there was cocaine in, in urns. urns that say in memory of exactly. John Smith. <laughs> and like, I, I mean... And uh, urns are pretty big <laughs> sometimes, yeah. you know, they're a decent size. And so why on earth would you assume that this like woman in like a very casual home is like on her, you know, mantle maybe or somewhere is just keeping giant containers filled with cocaine? Well, I would say if I was the police, I would go to these guys, their home and look for the urns. Cause it I know, sounds really. like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think they're keeping their cocaine in the urns, it sounds exactly. like. Exactly. And well, they unfortunately found out that they robbed the wrong thing. They took it a step further, tried to use the cocaine, oh, realized God. it was not that. Then they panicked, 
threw the errands into a nearby lake, saying they were worried their fingerprints might be on them. Oh, um, that's terrible, too. It's absolutely terrible. I know yeah. that authorities did send divers out to the lake to try to at least retrieve the urns. Yeah. Um, But, wow. Imagine yeah. going into a house thinking you're, you know, getting all this great stuff, and you quite literally end up snorting the remains of someone. Ridiculous. Like, that's karma. This is, like, don't be an idiot next time. Yeah. They all yeah. were arrested. On a handful full of burglary charges, and I feel horrible for that woman. Um, but I you know, too. yeah. Mm. 2016. Well, I think we need to end on a little bit of like an action note. So yep. here, here's a little action story for you guys. Two men enter a McDonald's in France. They fire a shotgun blast into the ceiling and tell everyone to get on the floor. I don't think they were there for the chicken McNuggets, Daniel. I mean, maybe they're pretty good sometimes. <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> they cleared out the registers, taken over 2,000 euros, and ran off. But then what happened? Nine of the customers got up and sprinted after them. One of the robbers tumbled at some stairs and was held down by some of the customers who apparently were armed themselves. The other robber was the one with the shotgun. He continues running off, decides he's going to fire some warning shots, hoping to scare off the mob that's after him. But these customers love the golden arches and had a response mm -hmm. with their own shots. One of the customers pulled out a gun and fired a neutralization shot to the robber's abdomen. They shot him in the guts, taking him down. And getting him into custody. You see, these weren't just your average McFlurry loving customers, Danielle. They were a group from an elite special operations unit of. The, oh, no. <laughs> yes, of the France, and I'm going to mess this up, Zandarmerie, a military group that handles law enforcement duties in rural areas in France. And they specialize, this group in particular, specializes in counterterrorism and hostage situations. <laughs> Man, the right place at the right time. Like the most unlucky criminals. That is fantastic. Like at first I was trying to figure out where it was going to go. I was like, okay, this is either a McDonald's close to where I live because <laughs> I'm so, I'm telling you, if anyone here lives in North Carolina, you know that we just like love to take things into our own hands. So I'm like, it's either a North Carolinian <laughs> McDonald's where the entire McDonald's is like, don't you dare. <laughs> don't you dare ruin my experience. <laughs> or there has to be something going on here. I actually yeah. really do love the way that it went. Oh my yeah. gosh, that's terrible. I can only imagine what the criminals were thinking too. They're probably like, wait a minute. <laughs> I know, I know. This is not going really how this- These are really dedicated customers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is not going how we expected. Um, yeah, the group, there was actually 11 in total. I think nine of them made the run and two stayed behind to kind of help secure <laughs> the building. Uh, but the only reason they didn't take the guys down sooner was because of the threat that they posed yeah, to exactly. the other customers. So they waited and then- mm -hmm acted after that but uh hope someone in france buys that group of big mac man they earned it i know it. they really did that's great <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right you guys it is that time who is going to win this month i already know i'm voting for john that was I'm probably, voting for danielle it was i will say that was probably one of my favorite stories that you've told though because i love karma i'm a huge believer in karma and i think that was just coming back to bite them and it's awesome yeah but you know it's not up to us it's up to you guys you get to vote who told the unluckiest criminal story and you can vote over at our twitter account at crime after pod for the first seven days after the episode drops or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and you can vote there. We also always have a link in the description box below. You can still click the letter I in the top corner of the screen and that will also send you straight there and you can vote from there. At crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon or shop our Teespring store. And a huge thank you to our patrons. Speaking of them, it's an absolutely awesome time over there. I always suggest it. You get to know a lot about John and myself. We do bonus Patreon special segments monthly, and we do a personal shout out to all of our new patrons. Absolutely. Next episode, we'll be back on July first with one I'm already looking forward to. I've mm -hmm. got a story in mind, but honestly, I'm staying open because this one, I don't know where it's going to go real life superheroes 
And that could be people mm-hmm. that are acting like superheroes in real life. We know there's a couple of guys running around putting yep. masks on at night and doing that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Or Liam, my son. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> not big time. It's like in our backyard with the chickens and the ducks, but he he's doing something. Someone has to keep them in order. <laughs> they do. Man. They do. Um, or it could also be people that have super heroic efforts that happen around crimes. Maybe someone turns into a ninja in the middle of mm-hmm. the day and saves the day. Real life superheroes, July 1st. I'm excited about that one. I think we're going to bring forward some really good stories. Definitely. This podcast is produced and hosted by myself, Danielle Hallen, and the amazing John Lorden. If you enjoy, if you enjoyed it, I'm going to get this wording right now. <laughs> you will. Just, I have faith. I was, I was flattered by the amazing <laughs> comment. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> no problem. If you, if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us: tell your friends, tell your family, tell everybody you love crime after crime, and they have to check it out. We'll see you guys next time. Take care. Bye.